All right, so we're just gonna quickly go over the biochemistry that's on exam three material. And this really has to do with DNA uh, duplication or replication, uh, transcription to make mRNA, and then translation from mRNA to protein. So uh, to start, we're looking at uh, DNA one, which is really the structure of DNA and what makes up um, DNA overall. And so DNA and RNA, our nucleic acids, are made up of uh, nucleotides. And you know what separates RNA from DNA? Well, it's really there for RNA, uh, for the sugar ribose, uh, you have an OH at the second carbon, whereas for uh, deoxy, ribonucleic acid DNA, you have, you have a hydrogen there, not um, an OH group, all right? Um, but you're going to have the uh, DNA and RNA are made up of nucleotides. Nucleotides are uh, nucleosides plus uh, phosphate groups. What are nucleosides? Well, they're nitrogenous base plus that uh, ribose or deoxyribose sugar. And so our nucleobases uh, take really five different forms that we care about, and we categorize them as either purines or pyrimidines. Purines, remember, as pure as gold, and we're expected to be able to identify these on an exam. And so uh, pure as gold, basically, we have two rings. And so uh, purines have two rings. Adenine is going to have no, so two rings and then no oxygen. So that's how we remember adenine. Guanine has two rings and no oxygen. And then um, we have our ribose bonds to uh, this nitrogen right here when the sugar comes in. And then um, pyrimidines are cytosine, uracil, and thymine. And we know that uracil is present in RNA, whereas thymine uh, pairs with adenine in, uh, in DNA. All right, and so the way to remember this, I start with thymine. Um, thymine has the most going on. You can see it's got two oxygens and it has a methyl group. Then we have uracil, which has two oxygens, but no methyl group. And then cytosine is the simplest, only one oxygen. All right, then um, this other information is good to know. You can look at this, uh, the review yourself for that. Uh, one important thing that seems to be tested on, uh, BDNA is the most common form of DNA. A, DNA is a compact form, it's more stable. And then Z, DNA is uh, left-handed. It's got a zigzag pattern, it's least stable. Uh, but we have been asked questions about denaturation for DNA. And the idea is that uh, the longer the strand of DNA is, the uh, higher melting temperature it will have to denature it, as well as the higher the percentage, relative percentage of guanines and um, cytosines, which are going to have one, two, three, one, two, three places to do nitrogen um, uh, nitrogen bonding, excuse me, um, that will increase the uh, difficulty at which, or like you need a higher temperature to separate the double strands. All right, um, for supercoiling, it's important to remember that um, you're going to wrap DNA around nucleosomes, and then if you were to say positive supercoiling is more supercoiling, negative is less supercoiling, and therefore easier to transcribe or replicate. All right, um, palindromic sequences, I've come up with some questions. Um, good way to check this is um, basically a palindromic sequence on a single strand should be able to bond with itself if you split it down the center. So here's an example, C, C, T, A, G, G. If you split it down the center, uh, A and T would bond, C and G would bond, and C and G would bond. So that would be a um, palindromic sequence. All right, then let's take a look at DNA replication. Uh, basically, we need to know the different enzymes involved. So uh, this one's representing uh, prokaryotes, but eukaryotes basically exactly the same, just different names for the enzymes. Uh, topo topoisomerase is going to relieve positive supercoiling. So basically it can do cut the DNA to relieve the stress um, caused by um, the supercoiling and allow our uh, helicase to go ahead and split those strands. Then we have DNA polymerase, which is going to elongate the new strand. Uh, the sliding clamp allows for pro processivity to occur, meaning it's bringing in those um, nucleotides to be added. And it also stabilizes the uh, nascent strands, so the new strands being made. Then we have single strand binding protein. And basically that just binds to um, open strands to keep them stable. Uh, strands that have been exposed, especially on the lagging strand side, the Okazaki fragment. Okay, um, then we have, you know, if we look more here, um, DNA polymerase one bacteria is for primer removal and repair. Uh, polymerase two is for repair. Polymerase three in bacteria is what's gonna be doing our polymerization. For eukaryotes, uh, it's important to know that um, Polymerase alpha is for primer synthesis, beta is for repair, and then uh, delta is for lagging strand, and epsilon is for leading strand synthesis. And then notice these both have some ability to excise um, nucleotides if they are put in incorrectly. Okay, then we have uh, basically going over these different proteins. Uh, helicase, which is unwinding the parent strand, the, the eukaryotic version of that is MCM proteins. The single strand binding proteins, uh, the eukaryotic version is RPA, replication protein A, and then the sliding clamp, aka the beta, plant, beta clamp, is uh, in eukaryotes the proliferating cell nuclear antigen, PCNA, and then both use um, DNA ligase. All right, um, other than that, uh, the telomeres and the telomerase. Uh, telomerase, we've been tested on, uh, it brings its own template, which is in the form of RNA to add to the ends of chromosomes. And so telomerase is an RNA dependent DNA polymerase, which would make it a reverse transcriptase. All right. And um, basically, cancer cells generally maintain the expression of their telomerase, whereas um, other cells do not. All right. And in terms of regulation, uh, basically, you know, having multiple origins of replications, um, you have them associated with CPG islands and G4 structures. Um, and yeah, there's two. I think the important thing here that we're probably going to be tested on is the cyclins and the uh, CDKs. And so uh, basically you have cyclins um, are proteins that get transcribed and their presence in the cell activates um, cyclin dependent kinases, which go through and phosphorylate things to control DNA replication or transcription and they act as different checkpoints. And so uh, this is a diagram that we had from the first exam. 
we can see there's different checkpoints throughout the cell. Um, but specifically starting with G1, we have cyclin D. The presence of cyclin D activates CD CDK4 and CDK6, which phosphorylates RB, which causes it to release elongation factor 2, which goes into the DNA to the promoter and causes cyclin A. Um, it goes to the DNA to the proto region, uh, recruits RNA polymerase, and RNA polymerase 2 in humans, and it will cause cyclin A and cyclin E to be transcribed. Cyclin E will activate CDK2, which will further phosphorylate RB protein, which will then further release, uh, will release additional uh, elongation factor 2s, causing more cyclin A and E to be transcribed. And then cyclin A is important because cyclin A's presence will activate CDK2, which will cause DNA replication to be initiated in the S phase of the cell cycle. All right, um, and then cyclin A will also activate CDK1, which will, in, which will initiate mitosis, and then we have CDK1 and cyclin B will continue mitosis at a different checkpoint during mitosis. All right, um, and then of course we have P53, which is another uh, tumor suppressor gene. It can pause, um, like basically any further transcription um, and induce uh, apoptosis by upregulating uh, P21. All right, but basically you have a bunch of DNA damage, then you're going to have uh, P53 expressed more to say, hey, pause. You know something's wrong. We can allow repair to occur if possible, uh, but we don't want further. We don't want to um, cause damaged DNA to be spread uh, through mitosis, or uh, significant expression can uh, allow the cell to undergo apoptosis. All right, so that's that one. Um, then we have DNA damage. There is a video that I made on the repair mechanisms, uh, but it's important to know some of the human syndromes as well. So we have MS236MLH1, PMS2, are defects in the repair pathway, which result in colon cancer, basically the mute S and mute L of the uh, mismatch repair mechanism, uh, which remember detects for like basically abnormal shape in double-stranded DNA. Um, we'll go ahead, and if you have basically not enough of these, then uh, colon cancer uh, is the most common outcome, but MS MSH236MLH1 PMS2 uh, typically result in colon cancer as you don't have enough of these guys. Then you have exodermia pigmentosa, uh, which is, results in skin cancer. It affects um, nucleotide excision repair, which is easy to remember because this uses a bunch of proteins, XP proteins. Nucleotide excision repair uses XP proteins um, to basically do the cutting and recruiting of polymerases to repair the uh, nucleotides. All right, ataxia, telangentasia, AT, leukemia, ATM protein. Uh, I don't think that one will be tested on. Uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are pretty important. Breast cancer, ovarian cancer. Uh, they affect homologous uh, recombination, so basically using a second chromosome to repair a uh, double-strand break in a first chromosome. And BRCA1 A and BRCA or BRCA and BRCA2 are responsible for um, getting RAD51 uh, associated with the ends of the damaged uh, double-stranded DNA, uh, which will cause those ends to become invasive and form the holiday complex with the uh, correct, or the still fully functional, uh, template chromosome that's going to be used for repair. So uh, this, if it's broken, then you can't do homologous recombination because you won't be able to get the broken strand to invade the healthy template. All right, Bloom syndrome uh, affects DNA, DNA helicase, uh, cancer at several sites. Uh, Warner syndrome, um, RecQ family helicase. Okay, uh, AIMS test is important to know. This one's come up on a couple of practice problems. Uh, basically, you're trying to check whether or not a chemical is a mutagen, and so uh, you grow uh, cells on uh, his minus bacteria, and then uh, you plate it onto his plus. Um, agar plates, and the idea is that uh, you shouldn't have these cells survive, but if they do survive, it's because the mutagen X has, the, the chemical X has caused a mutation and allowed these colonies to, these bacteria to, to form colonies. And so basically, you can determine whether or not X is going to act as a mutagen by comparing it, uh, by giving it to these bacteria and seeing if they survive. And so uh, basically, we have um, the bacteria cell plus uh, liver homogenate, which is going to contain the enzyme P450, and this acts as our control. Basically, the cells, bacteria cells shouldn't survive, and so the number of colonies that grow in H plus will be relatively low. And then, say, in this scenario, if we have this chemical uh, potential mutagen X, uh, we have it by itself, it's formed 450 colonies, and then X with the liver homogenate, which includes P450, uh, also made, um, allowed 450 colonies to, to form. So basically, our takeaway from this is that, you know, X is mutagenic um, and doesn't need to be activated. by P450, all right? Uh, here we have a different scenario where, because basically the premise is like the ultimate, uh, a lot of the times chemicals will become mutagenic after they go through the liver and are exposed to P450. And so here we have um, a different scenario where we see that this chemical Y is not mutagenic. Uh, y is only mutagenic after P450 liver activation. Okay, but the AIMS test basically allows us to determine that um, whether or not a chemical is mutagenic or not. All right, uh, repair pathways made a repair video, pathway video, take a look at that instead. Um, if we're looking at transcription from DNA to uh, RNA, uh, there's not too much to know. I mean, there's a lot to know here, but um, basically we have, uh, on a strand of DNA, we have a promoter region, which is where our RNA polymerase, which is going to do the creation of the uh, new RNA, is going to bind. But in order to do that, it has to have a transcription factor, uh, bind there first, and then recruit the rest of the RNA polymerase. And so... Um, we have uh, the RNA polymerase overall is made up of a core enzyme plus this transcription factor sigma. And I'm using the name transcription factor sigma. Uh, we wouldn't technically use transcription factor here. Uh, we just refer to it as you know, sigma uh, subunit. But if you compare it to what's going on with eukaryotes, eukaryotes need transcription factors to recruit the polymerases, to have the polymerases bind. And there's many different types of transcription factors for eukaryotes. For bacteria, they don't have those many different types. They just have the sigma subunit to bind to the DNA uh, promoter regions. All right, and so uh, in the promoter regions, you have uh, 
minus 10, so 10 upstream from the start of transcription, uh, you have the prib now box, which is the uh, T-A-T-A-T, -A -T, uh, minus 35 region. Uh, there's also another one that's common, uh, T-T-G-A-C-A. -A. And yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, in terms of elongation, you know, you're just adding five prime to three prime. Uh, termination, you have two main types of termination bacteria. You have in prokaryotes, row dependent and row independent. Uh, row dependent is basically you have this row protein complex which binds to the RNA that's being made and it chases down the RNA polymerase and knocks it off such that the RNA polymerase uh, will no longer transcribe and so it terminates the transcription. Row independent, uh, basically you have the RNA is going to form a hairpin loop typically from a palindromic sequence and that will basically cause the, um, uh, so palindromic DNA uh, creates a hairpin loop in the new DNA, the RNA being transcribed, uh, which will essentially cause the RNA polymerase to uh, disconnect due to its weird shape. All right, in antibiotics that inhibit transcription, actinomycin D um, prevents using DNA as a template, um, and then rifampicin um, binds to RNA polymerase and blocks exit of the nascent strand, so inhibits initiation. All right, then we have mRNA, rRNA, tRNA, and it's important to know in prokaryotes, these are all made by a single RNA polymerase, whereas in eukaryotes, we have three different types of RNA polymerases. In particular, we have RNA polymerase 1, which makes rRNA, polymerase 2 makes mRNA, polymerase 3 makes tRNA. Uh, the promoters, the promoter regions, uh, you have the most common one is the, the Tata box, um, and then uh, you have other um, transcription factors, so transcription factors, just like the uh, sigma subunit in prokaryotes, transcription factors, uh, which we see here, have to bind to the promoter region to allow the RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter and start transcription. Okay, uh, core promoters, uh, so we have the Tata promoter uh, for regulated or tissue-specific genes, and then you have the initiator element promoters, which offer uh, constitutive housekeeping genes, and they have multiple transcription starts. All right, uh, other than that, once you have your pre-RNA made, it still needs to be uh, five prime capped. Uh, it needs to have the introns spliced out. We remember that introns stay in the nucleus, exons, exit the nucleus, right? So we need to splice out the introns so they stay in the nucleus, and then the introns will be squished together and kept. Uh, we cap it, uh, which protects it from exonucleus de um, degradation, uh, recruits exporting for transport, and then uh, we have the splicing of the introns out uh, to keep the exons, and then we add a poly-A tail by poly-A polymerase. Uh, again, it protects from endonucleus cleavage. All right, in terms of splicing, you have uh, self-splicing RNA. Uh, you also have uh, spliceosomes, which can do splicing. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of detail here that I honestly don't think we're going to be touched on, but please read it. Uh, enhancers are sections of DNA that bind activators or repressors. Uh, and then you have mediators, which are protein complexes that um, bind to uh, the activators or repressors that are bound to enhancers. And basically, it allows them to, because our enhancer regions are typically far away from our promoter region. So we'll have our promoter region with, say, transcription factors bound to it, and then your mediator can be bound to that, and then bound to the mediator is our activator with the enhancer that it's bound to. And then you have insulators, which can basically keep our enhancers um, from working on or interacting outside of uh, this particular loop for transcription. Okay, then uh, hormone receptors, uh, I think, you know, just reproduce yourself, uh, epigenetic regulation, it's pretty straightforward with methylation. All right, uh, there's a whole lot going on here with the technologies, I think I'm going to make a different video for that. We have uh, translation, finally, I think important to know here is that uh, we have the codons are unambiguous, meaning one codon per one amino acid, but they are degenerate, which means that um, there's redundancy. You can have uh, four uh, tRNAs can code for the same amino acid. All right, then we have amino acyl tRNA synthetase, which goes through and charges the tRNA. Uh, ribosomes for eukaryotes, it's the 80S ribosome complex, which is made up of the 60S uh, large unit and the 40S small unit. And then for bacteria, it's 70S, 50S, and 30S. All right, and then um, for initiation, you have the shine delgarno sequence, which is near the 5' end of the mRNA. It's important to know that for an mRNA in the uh, prokaryotes can have, uh, can code for multiple proteins, where for eukaryotes, uh, an mRNA will only code for one protein. And so what this means is that the shine delgarno sequence, which is where our ribosome is going to ultimately bind and then you know, move down to start uh, transcription or translation, uh, there must be one shine delgarno sequence per gene, per, excuse me, per protein that's being made from this mRNA, right? Where that's not the case with um, the corresponding mechanism on eukaryotes, uh, where you would not have, um, we have the COSAC sequence, and you have one COSAC sequence per uh, mRNA for eukaryotes. All right, then we have the start codon, which is AUG. It's good to know. Important to know that uh, in initiation factors, so we have one and three, um, and then initiation factor two, IF2, is going to uh, bring in the start codon um, tRNA, so FMET tRNA, and bring it into the small subunit. Okay, uh, and that's something we can see here, so take a look at that diagram. All right, and then uh, eventually when you're ready for termination, we have, you know, the same codons, you are, uh, or you are annoying, you go away, you are gone. These are our stop codons. Okay, not too bad. And then let's just take a quick look at our uh, eukaryotic translation. Uh, basically, it's important to know is we're using, um, instead of initiation factors, we're using ELF3, so elongation factors, which is kind of annoying. Um, but you have ELF1 and ELF3 are going to uh, bind to the small subunit, just like they did in uh, prokaryotes, but it was IF1 and IF3, and get it to attach to, in this case, the uh, COSAC sequence. Um, and it will, or excuse me, the start site will be in the COSAC sequence. The um, 
initiation complex is going to bind uh, at the 5 prime end of the mRNA and then scan down until it finds the COSAC sequence. Um, and then elongation factor 2 is going to recruit the uh, first tRNA and then eventually be released once it binds to the P site of the ribosome. So we have P, we have the exit site, we have the um, polymerization site, and then we have the active site. Um, right, but the first codon is going to be here, first TNR, tRNA, and then the rest of them come in here and um, eventually each codon leaves through the exit site. Okay, and I'd say for the rest of this, uh, it's relatively straightforward. I'll read through quickly. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's about it. All right, good job, man.